let me begin by saying welcome. Greetings to everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you, especially in response to our terrific guest. Now what I'd like to do is thank our guest and welcome our guest. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to host uh, Professor James Lang. Uh, he is a professor at Assumption College. Uh, you can see here from his title uh, what he's up to. You can also look in the bottom of your screen. Uh, you should be able to see two links uh, I believe they're kind of yellowish color, to two of his books. Uh, one of them on small teaching, one of them on small teaching online. This is where he is engaged in showing us how to improve our teaching and learning, and especially how to improve right away, even with small basic initial steps. So I'm absolutely delighted to bring him on here because this is a topic of a great deal of interest, especially as more and more campuses are looking to either have some kind of blended learning experience or a wholly online experience this fall. Um, Professor Lang, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, and uh, I'll have to stop calling Professor Lang and call you Jim. Just to, That's right. This is, uh, we were as formal or informal as we want to be. Jim, uh, looking ahead for the next, say, well, the next academic year um, for yourself, what are what are the big topics that you're going to be wrestling with? What are the major ideas? I mean, is it mostly going to be helping prepare assumption faculty uh, for teaching however they're going to be teaching this fall, or, or what? So this is going to get derailed right away because I'm on sabbatical to come here. <laughs> Timing. Yeah, so you know, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be grateful that this was my sabbatical year. Um, I have been working with um, our interim director, Sarah Kavanaugh, on uh, preparing our faculty uh, for the coming year, but I am going to kind of slide away from that and um, you know work on my own writing projects as sabbatical is designed to do. Uh, oh, wow! Coming out in October, so I'm going to be doing a decent amount of work mm -hmm. on that, um, preparing for that, and then trying to get another book written before the end of the, the academic year. As as I said before, you, my friend, are a writing machine. Uh, we have. <laughs> Uh, most people don't get out two books in their lifetime, much less two books. <laughs> unless you have three others, and now two more to come. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be in demand as people uh, try to figure out how to not just adjust their teaching to a new environment, but how to how to teach well. Yeah. Well, I, I have I have all kinds of questions to ask, and and friends. <laughs> I'm just going to start off with one or two, but the forum is here for you. So the questions you have are the most important. Again, remember, if you want to join us up here on stage with a video, just press the raised hand button. If you want to type in a question, just type it in that uh, question mark box. Uh, my first question uh, is, you've used this title, this phrase, small teaching. And I'm wondering if you could explain that for everybody. What does small teaching mean for you? The idea of small teaching kind of emerged after um, I wrote a book that came out in 2013 on uh, academic dishonesty called Cheating Lessons. And um, I got a lot of invitations to speak at colleges and universities as a result of that book, because, of course, everyone, um, you know, has wants to address this issue in one way or the other. And as I gave those presentations, I kind of found that, um, you know, people were interested in the ideas and the theories and all that stuff. But but people kind of perked up when I would get sort of to the second half and I would start to mentioned some specific things that people could do in their classes. Um, and I kind of started to, to, to just feel like that's oftentimes what people came to these events for, was they, they were looking for practical concrete steps in terms of what they could do in the classroom tomorrow. And, and you know, I was often coming in the middle of the semester too, like people would be inviting me to speak in October, right? And, um, and, and part of the recommendations I was making were sort of big course design kind of stuff. And the thing is, when you get that recommendation in October, it's like it's the middle of my semester. I, I'm not going to redesign my class. And by the time January rolls around, I'm going to forget that this guy was ever here. And right. what I tried to sort of start playing around with was introducing ideas that were like applicable tomorrow or that things that people could really put into practice. And I just noticed that people kind of perked up when they heard these suggestions and um, had a really positive reaction to them. So that and there, I mean, a couple of other things that kind of went into the background of putting the book together. But ultimately, I became interested in that question. Like, you know, if I if you invite me to your campus and it's March, um, how can I be helpful to the faculty by giving them ideas that they can implement right away? And then I've always had a I've always had an interest in 
learning research and how people learn. I find that stuff really fascinating. Um, you know, I consider myself, you know, I've, I've never been out of school. You know, I went straight through to graduate school and into faculty life. And um, so I, I always have, have been interested when I read studies or like experiments about how do people learn things. Um, so I kind of put those two things together to, to identify learning principles okay. that used to guide small changes that faculty could make um, to their teaching and particularly ones that they could implement. Like I said, you know, read this section of the book, you can get this into practice tomorrow or next week. Um, so that was how the original thing came about. And just to, just to finish up on the second thing. So when I, then when I started giving, pre that book came out in 2016, I started giving presentations and getting invitations to speak about that book. And the first question that I always got was, how do I do this in my online classes? And at that time, I had never taught online. So I would have to just say, you know, you figure, you know, here are the principles, use the principles and, and you know, see how you might be able to apply them yourself. And occasionally I would make this joke. If anyone is a great online teacher and wants to write the small teaching sequel, let me know. I'll be happy to. Well, I was doing this um, in Arizona and Flower Darby came up to me afterwards and said, I want to be the one that writes small teaching online. I like that kind of initiative. So I said, all right, you know, let's let's you know, send me a sample of your writing. And it was great. And um, and so then she taught me a lot about um, how to apply some of these same principles to the online environment uh, and did an amazing job of putting it together in the book. Um, so I just wrote about, you know, I wrote an introduction and I wrote the theory sections of each chapter, but she she really brought her years and years of practical experience to bear on that book. Uh, Flower is amazing. We've had her as a guest, yeah. and she's just she's just brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Well, well, speaking of speaking of brilliance, uh, I asked for questions, and they started coming thick and fast. So, uh, let me uh, let me bring up one. This is from uh, uh, this is from Dom Caristi at Ball State. Uh, uh, let's see if we can flash this text question up on the screen. Ironically, some students resist change. How have they responded to mid-semester changes? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's kind of a whole literature actually on, for example, on student resistance to active learning. Um, I think we have to strike a balance here, right? I mean, the students come into the class and you, you've kind of presented them, here's the way the class is gonna function. Um, so I would not necessarily recommend sort of design changes or changes to the assessment structure in sort of midstream. Typically the kind of small changes I would recommend people are implementing are trying different things in the classroom, right? So like um, maybe trying a different way to, to host a discussion or a different way to um, a different kind of, you know, like um, writing activities, or stuff like that. Things that, you know, I would ideally, um, your classroom is a place where you're regularly kind of trying different things and when you're together in a face-to-face -face environment or when you're, um, you know, having students do their activities online in an online class. Um, I'm always experimenting with different things that I, I hear about. So there, I think the experimentation is, is going to be a little bit easier for students to digest than sort of stopping halfway through and saying, um, you know, I'm going to change the, the final project completely. I think there are some issues there because students plan, you know, need to be able to plan their lives and, and plan for um, I know I sometimes will see students who have got their calendars, like their paper calendars, and it's like all their assignments mapped out and everything. So I think we have to be careful about those kinds of changes mid-semester. So ideally, um, you know, we're able to experiment midstream, respond to things that are going wrong um, or new things that we want to try. But, but the bigger kind of design changes, we probably need to wait for new classes to begin those. Oh, that's a great question, Don. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope you're enjoying summer in Indiana. And thank you, Jim. That's a that's a splendid, splendid answer. Again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a, of a text question. Um, and here should be an example of a video question. This is from uh, Carl uh, Hakarinen, who comes to us from not too far away from you. Oh, hey, Carl. Hi, Jim. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, Jim and I talked a couple of years ago regarding a lifelong learning class that I was teaching on learning styles. And we've had to, uh, we're also affiliated with Assumption University, and we had to pivot this spring and now into the summer and fall, taking our classes for people, median age is about 73, bringing them all online. 
And this has raised, you know, not surprisingly, some technical issues, but also uh, adapting teaching styles to people, for people who have not experienced online uh, education before in any uh, substantive way. So my question to you, Jim, is uh, when you are trying to pivot your online uh, courses or when other faculty are trying to pivot their online courses to a more diverse community than you, um, where you know, people may be familiar with the classroom experience, but now they have to uh, work online, uh, overcoming some technical challenges, overcoming some pedagogical challenges of how do I keep pace? How do I interact with uh, my other uh, colleagues, my, the other students in the class. And also, uh, uh, particularly for our age group, uh, the, the extra challenges of uh, disabilities such as hearing disability. Mm. We're finding that online classes, particularly with people who have long mustaches and beards, uh, makes it very difficult uh, for people to do lip reading. So that's a long wind up to say, um, how, yeah. how well do we, um, or what are some tips on adapting uh, small teaching and online instruction in general to uh, groups who have not generally experienced uh, online instruction before? All right, thanks, Carl. Um, so I, you know, in my view, the, the kind of path we should take as we're, as especially for those of us who are converting traditional face-to-face -face classes into online classes is, is the same. Um, even, you know, no matter what um, audience we're facing, and we think about this in terms of universal design for learning, right, we should be designing for access to all learners, whether, whether they're um, traditional age students or whether they're for, for, um, for further education. And in my view, um, and this, this, you know, we have done some work trying to promote this perspective to faculty, and it's certainly not original to me, but um, to address the issue of the fact that, you know, people have technical problems or people have access problems or people, all those kinds of stuff. Um, and yet to also address the fact that people want, especially I think maybe seniors who are looking for community, right? And so who are looking for the opportunity to, um, to meet with the instructor, to have conversations with the instructor and their fellow peers. Um, the approach that I think we should be taking to these classes is to start with an asynchronous foundation, right? So like the, the course content, um, as much as possible, we're, we're providing that asynchronously and that's um, you know, the readings, video lectures, whatever it might be, the stuff that we want students to get first exposure to, um, we're providing that to them asynchronously. And that helps address the access problem, right? Because if someone can't log in in a particular moment, they, they can get access to that stuff, you know, in their own time and in their own ways. And we try to make it accessible to them as possible. But then we, we add that sort of on top of that, then we add the synchronous layer, right? Where we are then providing these additional opportunities for them to engage with the material um, in real time with, with one another. Um, so in my view, that, that's kind of the best of both worlds as we're thinking about how to build these classes now, especially for the fall semester for folks who are gonna be doing it. Um, and and it, to me, this is also kind of the way to, to have what Josh Eiler and others have called resilient pedagogy, right? If you build the class this way, it, it can persist no matter what happens. Um, right. So like if, if you start with that asynchronous foundation, then you add the layers of synchronous conversation and community. The asynchronous foundation is going to persist no matter what. That's available, whether you're online or face to face. The synchronous opportunities can then happen, whether they're, you know, mediated through screens or whether you're actually in the classroom or however it might want, you know, that might end up being. So to me, that's the way to provide the best possible access to all learners and to yet to still try to give. Um, try to prioritize what I think seniors and, 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 and many of our students are looking for as well, which is the connection in the community with the other um, other people that are in the class. So, you know, that's a pretty basic recommendation, but um, I think that's that's the direction that we should be going at least until we get through this, this period where, where things could be disrupted so easily. Thank you, that was very helpful. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, that's a great question. And good luck with that class. Thank you. Nice to see you, my friend.
And by the way, Carl's question noted something that is important uh, about our biography, which is that we are now Assumption University <laughs> as of June. <laughs> when you first contacted me, we were Assumption College. Now we are Assumption University. <laughs> 2020 is a busy year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so congratulations at uh, yeah. Assumption University. That's a big step. Yeah. Uh, so, friends, if, if, if you're new to the forum, that's a video question, uh, and you can see how easy that is to do. And uh, we'll try this again with another question coming from uh, Ray Miller at Appalachian State. Let's see if we can bring Ray up on stage. Hello, Professor Miller. How are you? Good. Hello. Thank you. Uh, it's really good to uh, meet with you, James. I read your book, Small Teaching Online, um, and it was very helpful. Um, uh, this is my question. Um, oftentimes we teach classes that we already know and, and, and other times we teach courses in which we really want to learn something that we don't know. You step into that, into that minefield. Um, uh, for those of us who are teaching asynchronous courses online and we're relatively new, how do we set up that course so that we can allow for growth and change for us as the instructor? as well as for the student, meaning it seems as though you have to know an awful lot more in setting up an online course in terms of making sure everything's set in place before it goes live. But if you're doing it for the first time, and if the course itself is relatively new in terms of the content, how can we set this up so that the students and you feel as though it's okay to grow and to change as the 15 weeks go on and not, oh gosh, he's changing things on. Oh gosh, he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh gosh, it's a mistake. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you. Sure, yeah, so I'll recommend a resource first. There's a book by Therese Houston called, I think it's called Teaching What We Don't Know. Um, mm -hmm. That title exactly right, but it's worth looking at um, even for this context that you're asking about. Um, Therese Houston is the author's name, H-U-S-T-O-N. Uh, so that's picking up just to think in general about this issue of teaching when we're uh, not, we don't feel quite experts on the subject. Okay, so um, I'm going to just, you know, throw out one suggestion. Um, and this was something that um, I experimented with actually in my spring class, which converted halfway through. And it ended up working very well. Um, so what we did was um, I had asked the students, the, I had assigned for each week of the semester that the students were going to create a resource collection on the topic of that week. So the students worked in groups, for example, so this was a, a British literature survey class, um, British literature from you know, 1800-ish to the present. And um, so they were asked to um, do research and put together a collection of resources on a historical topic that was relevant for that week's literature. For example, the um, the Irish potato famine um, when we were doing when we were in the middle of the 19th century. And what they had to do was they had to put together a collection of resources that included a video overview, like, and they, they were looking for sourced videos. They, they looked for an image or two that they could analyze. They had to find like basically sort of overview like encyclopedia-ish type entries. But it was just designed for, and, and then that material became part of the course content. In fact, there was a question about some of the resources on the final exam. So the students were kind of responsible, which was why it was kind of at that level of like basic introductory stuff. Um, and the, what the students did was they annotated five of these resources. So each resource was the thing, like the image or the video, a one paragraph annotation explaining why it was important and what, what would it help us understand. Hmm. And I think you could, you, 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 without having to do that specifically, um, what you might think about is, you know, you're gonna be able to provide the structure but then, and get in, get yourself into the first, you know, five weeks or whatever it might be. But then in those, the latter half of the class, let students know, you know, you're gonna have, be responsible for building up some of the content for this class. Now, the, I will say that this was a little bit of additional work for me because I had to meet with each group beforehand and, and I had to help curate the, the resources. In fact, I typically asked them to come up with seven to 10 and then I would help them winnow it down to five. So, but again, in some cases, this was these were um, things that I didn't know all that much about. Like I knew it was important, and some of the literature referred to these events. But, but it, it was great. I learned a ton from it. And the best part was actually because the course ended up. Well, we were doing it all all along. We were doing it on the LMS. Um, I have those resources now for the future, right? So, like, if I want to do it a little bit differently next time, 
I've got like, you know, 12 weeks of curated resources that I could be providing to students um, in the future. So I would, you know, suggest that you be transparent about this and say, I've left this sort of big strip of the course open for you to help me fill in. Um, and we're gonna sort of develop our expertise in these areas together. Um, that would be the only really concrete suggestion that I have here. Great, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ray, for the great question. Um, and um, Jim, again, what a rich answer. <clears throat> if you, in the chat box and on Twitter, people are just lighting up, pointing at Harvard University Press to get uh, copies of that book on teaching what you don't know. Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, and we have uh, we have more questions that are that are just flooding in. So let me just give everyone a, a shot here. Uh, this is one from um, Lisa Sieverts uh, at Harvard Extension. She says, "In small teaching, you say the flipped classroom does not automatically provide outstanding learning experiences. Could you say more about how to use the flipped classroom effectively?" Yeah, I mean, I guess what I what, you know what I meant by that was um, you know we can't just sort of expect that we're going to adapt off some horse sale pedagogy and that things are going to that's going to transform the learning of our students right you can teach a flipped class as badly as you can teach a lecture class um in my view I, i'm always a kind of um you know my father always said to me the truth is usually somewhere in the middle and i i kind of still believe that these days that um that the that, uh, the classroom experience to, to 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 put everything outside of the classroom experience like all you know um all the content and then I just expect nothing but sort of meaningful discussion or problem solving or work in the classroom um, that doesn't necessarily solve the problem or like automatically going to create a great class um, and so that there are kind of things that I think we still need to be doing in a flipped classroom like you know providing students sort of reminders or overviews of like sort of key content like a lot of humanities classes are basically taught as flipped classrooms they always have been Right, like you know, a literature class. Um, the students do the reading outside of the class, and then when they come into class, we discuss it. So, like that's been the tradition. Derek Bruff was the one that pointed this out to me, um, at a Vanderbilt Center for Teaching. That humanities classes often have have worked like this for a long time. So, but uh, and so th those of us in the humanities know that can go just as badly <laughs> as as a lecture class with powerpoints. Um, so, you know, in my view. I think the flipped classroom just kind of has to continue to kind of look for the, the same basic learning principles that we're, you know, looking for in any kind of classroom experience. You want to mix stuff, right? So um, the book that I that I have coming out in October is about attention and how we maintain, capture mm -hmm. and maintain attention of students throughout um, a class period. And one of the things I really learned from that research was the importance of variety and change, right? So like um, our attention is renewed by variety and change. So if you're going to have students come in and just, you know, I, I find it very difficult to get students to sit and sort of in a circle and discuss meaningful stuff for 75 minutes, right? We need to be doing some other stuff occasionally. So like, instead of doing something like that, I'm more likely to have a mini lecture, 15 or 20 minutes, do a little sort of activity on paper where they're preparing for the discussion and then have the discussion and then like a finishing activity. And to me, that's kind of what we should be thinking about in terms of flip, cl flip classroom is not so much like it's some, you know, complete opposite of a lecture class. Um, I think we should just be looking at how do we have active, engaged classrooms? Um, if they're getting sort of multiple streams of kind of learning experiences. Sometimes they're listening. Sometimes they're seeing things. Sometimes they're talking to one another. Sometimes, you know, we're talking as a class. Um, I would view that as being sort of more important than kind of going wholesale in on like some specific pedagogical approach, I guess. Well, that's a very, very detailed answer. Uh, and that just shows, I think, the, the depth of the topic. Uh, Lisa, yeah. thank, you. thank you very much for this question. Um, uh, people are also sharing the uh, news about this next book. It's just called uh, uh, Distracted, isn't it? It's called Distracted. The, the original title that I wanted was teaching distracted minds. And the idea there was that all of our minds are distracted. So how do we how do we best sort of teach to a distracted mind? And there was no sort of reference there that some students are somehow different from oh. 50 years ago or that we are. But as anyone who's published a book knows, or even an article, you sometimes the publisher wants a different title that they think is going to get more people's attention. So anyways, I'm not going to apologize for it endlessly, but. No, it's great. It's great. Um, <laughs> The idea is that, you know, 
why students can't focus is for the same reason that all of us have trouble focusing because we have we have distractible brains. Um, and instead of what we should be doing is thinking not so much about how to wall out distractions, um, which are outside of us, but are also in here. Um, said, how do we, what captures people's attention? What sustains people's attention? And how can we take those things and incorporate them into our teaching? That's well put. That sounds like a thesis statement from our book. Um, that's <laughs> yeah, that's my elevator pitch. I'm getting good at it. You, you have to be. Uh, the, um, uh, speaking of attention, we had uh, two questions that came up about something that is getting all of our attention, uh, which is the pandemic. And uh, Amy H. Uh, at Adrian College, hello, Amy. Um, she asked, uh, how do we balance the small teaching approach in the face of the major changes, whether known or unknown, needed due to the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, so that's, I mean, one way to think about this is again, like thinking about the sort of basic structure of the classes that that um, people will be offering in the fall, right? If, if again, we kind of take that approach that I recommended earlier, where we're providing an asynchronous foundation and, and then kind of having these, but, but then, and, that, and then we have that synchronous synchronous element as well, whether that's in the classroom like normal or um, online discussion, you know, online Zoom classes or, or some combination of both, the same principles are still going to be used to guide that, right? Like in the same kind of small principles that will help promote learning can be used to guide that. So, for example, um, you know, one of the things that, that we've learned about over many years now about um, providing video content to people is um, we want to keep that those video content relatively short, right? So if you look at video, there was a study done of over, I think it was something like 7 million video users, um, uh, or user, 7 million uh, participants in uh, four very large long-standing MOOCs. And the video looked at, and the, and the research looked at how long did people watch the videos, uh, the video content. And if you look at the numbers, they kind of, it goes up, people are for the most part watching the videos, I think up to nine minutes. And then from nine to 12 minutes, it just kind of falls off the cliff, hmm. right? So like, um, you know, if, you're, if you have a 45 minutes of content that you want to present to students, the small teaching change here is don't make a 45 minute video lecture. That's really hard for any of us to sit through. Um, and I would include myself in that, right? So two good reasons to instead break that down into three or four shorter segments are, first of all, it's just better for our attention. When we're watching videos at home or whatever, there's so much stuff going on. I can hear people walking around my house. There's a dog and a cat in here. You know, the, the doorbell could ring, the phone could buzz. So there's just a lot more distractions than there are available to me than there are in a classroom. But the other thing about it is, um, you know, you I, I'm taking a class and I'm like, okay, 45 minute video lecture. I don't have time for that right now. Um, so I'm just gonna keep putting it off till I can find that chunk of time, which, you know, isn't hard for us to find sometimes in our busy lives, but I can find time for 10 minutes. So it's going to be easier for me to consume that content when it's broken down into those smaller bits. So I think the principles are the same, um, and we can still use the principles to guide our creation of these classes, um, especially if we kind of think about there's these two parts to the class, right? There's the asynchronous provision of content, which in a way, I mean, that sounds like it's something new, but it's really not. Like I'm asynchronously providing content to my students when I'm having them read a novel outside of class. Mm -hmm. That, that you might think about just like that. And then there's the synchronous stuff that we're doing um, on camera or in person. And again, there too, the kind of stuff that we, we know works, like for example, having people write down um, a few thoughts before they speak. Well, in my class, they typically do that in a handwritten writing exercise or even a typewriting exercise if they're using a laptop. They can certainly do that in the chat room, right? Like So, so these, I think things can translate if, if we just are able to kind of think, you know, how does, um, what, what is, what's the principle that I need for this particular environment, asynchronous or synchronous, and, and how can I make it work in that, those different contexts? Well, th thank you. That's, that's, uh, you, you covered a lot of ground in just a couple of minutes there. Uh, the, the chat box has lit up with people making different observations. Um, uh, Rachel Barlow notes that uh, podcasts are being very intimate and that they'll mm -hmm. feel like one person talking to you. Uh, Charles Finley gets a little more sarcastic and says, hashtag TikTok learning is our future. Uh, Alejandro uh, Muzanaga, uh, for, forgive me if I mispronounced your name, Alejandro, says the sweet spot for video lectures is five minutes, uh, she's found. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, you know, th there's different studies on that, right? Like, so, um, you know, I'm referring to this one 
um, that I saw, which had that kind of, I mean, it had a pretty substantial, but it was MOOC. So like, that's a little bit different than a four credit class. Um, you know, the thing about TikTok, again, like I would just, you know, I would ask people to kind of reflect upon their own experiences, right? Like, so mm-hmm. and I think this is worth thinking about actually for those of us who experienced the transition in the spring and for those of us who are frequently on Zoom meetings and webinars right now, are you locked in for one hour and not doing anything else for that time? Or do you find your attention wandering over to your phone or you're doing other things while this is happening? If you're experiencing that, you should expect that your students are going to experience it as well. Yeah. So, you know, if you've, if you've been in a department meeting uh, on, your, on, your, you know, on Zoom or whatever, and you were doing other stuff, right? Like, guilty, right? Like, I mean, you should, ex- you, you have to think about your students are going to have a similar experience. So, for that reason, I would favor these kinds of shorter exposure items in the same way that I would favor shorter exposure to lecture content in the classroom. And, you know, lecturing for 15 or 20 minutes and then doing something versus lecturing for 75 minutes. Students, you know, our minds are going to wander and the students' minds have always wandered in those contexts. If, if- a few sentences back, uh, you you mentioned um, drawing on uh, on our uh, reflecting on our personal work, and we just had a relevant question that came up from uh, New York on this from Sarah Sullivan at Saint Bonaventure, and uh, Sarah asks, "How much honesty could I bring to the classroom about this year's challenges? Child care concerns about COVID, not a clear map for how best to teach in this environment." Yeah, so Sarah Cavanaugh uh, does great work in this area, and um, so she her book, The Spark of Learning, um, which came out a few years ago, um, looked at emotions in the college classroom. But one of the things she actually looked at was self disclosure. Um, so, how much self disclosure by the what what does self disclosure by the instructor do for student learning, student sort of perceptions of the class and the instructor? And consistent with something I said earlier, they uh, and my sort of general views on life, the. The, 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 the research finding was, you know, a modest amount can be helpful in sort of giving a, sort of a humanized view of the instructor, um, creating more of that sense of community. But you can tip the, the balance too much in either direction. Right. And it seems to I believe um, I have to double check this and maybe someone can can confirm this as well. My other recollection about this research was that the more positive self-disclosure was be- was was better like in other words to, to you don't want to self-disclose too much about like all of the sort of negative things you're experiencing or your um all of your you know fears and anxieties that maybe some of that can help humanize you but too much of that seems to maybe have a negative effect and you probably think about this in the way that we we have our social media context and, and we all know people that sort of are just consistently self-disclosing negatively on social media and like how sometimes you're like, okay, you know, I feel for you, but I don't want to read this all the time, right? Like, and I think there's probably something similar that happens in that classroom dynamic. So I guess my my overall view would be, you know, you should not hesitate to, you know, have some self-disclosure to students. That seems to be um, a good thing for humanizing you and creating community in the classroom, but you shouldn't overdo it. And it shouldn't be just negative like that. You should also maybe, if you're going to talk about the challenges we face, you might also talk about how you're uh, addressing those challenges and some of the sort of positives that have come out of or that are coming out of your experience with, um, you know, your new whatever it might be, right? Like, so, you know, see if you can find some of those positives to convey to the students as well, because, of course, students need to hear, right? Like, they're facing a lot of difficult challenges as well, and we want to help sort of Boy, one another's up, boost one another, you know, during this difficult time. So, well, thank you. That's a, a, a and people are pouncing on this book. So, um, now, did, didn't you? That's from West Virginia. Yes, that's from the book series I edit at West Virginia University Press. So, I highly recommend we have a bunch of great titles. Uh, West Virginia University Press Teaching and Learning in Higher Education is the book series. Sounds fantastic. Thank you. And uh, again, that was a great question. That was a great question. We have we have more questions coming in. Uh, we have another uh, another video question, uh, and this comes from a longtime uh, friend and supporter of the program, Tom Hames. So let me bring Tom up on stage uh, from Texas. Hello, Tom. Hi, guys. Um, 
So um, actually, I had a question, but I was distracted, so I forgot. Not to <laughs> uh, that was easy. So uh, <laughs> tell me that's not going to be the first time I hear that joke. <laughs> that's not going to be the last time. I mean. That's not going to be the last time. Do you, do you want me to do? You want me to talk about my dogs? No, just okay. <laughs> so um, no, my 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 question is as follows. Um, uh, what I'm seeing a lot of right now, at least in my institution, I'm hearing the scuttlebutt in the, in the larger world is that with everything going on, everything being so chaotic, that there's this drive toward conformity, that you're you know, trying to build all the classes so that they kind of look alike and that the students don't have you know, unusual learning experiences. And in my experience, that works against, first of all, innovation in the classroom, experimentation, precisely the kind of things you're talking about. Um, what is your feeling on the balance between those two competing demands on class design? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because on the one hand, students who are dealing with all this disruption, it might be helpful for them to have some consistency. Um, I guess so I can see the rationale for that. I will say, though, on the other hand, um, you know, I had students, so we advise faculty advisors at my institution. So I have, you know, a couple dozen advisees that I'm working with every year. And so we had to advise them after we had transitioned to online learning. And so I, you know, whenever I, when I so I had Zoom meetings with all of them and, um, and of course, just asked them how their classes were going. And I was kind of curious as director of the teaching center, like what people were doing. So I always say, you know, how many of your classes are uh, you know, have switched basically to being an online and asynchronous, how many are synchronous. And what I kind of found from that was that they actually appreciated having not everything be synchronous or asynchronous. Like they liked having a little bit of, um, you know, opportunity to do something different so that they weren't doing all their classes just online or they weren't doing some of them had like all five professors were just continuing to meet exactly as they had just same time, same amount of times each week through Zoom, um, as if you know that was they, they were just continuing their face to face, um, and both those things pose challenges for the students. If it was all asynchronous, they were having trouble organizing themselves, right? Like in understanding how to meet their deadlines. If it was all synchronous, they were at home and they were like things that might interfere with when they needed to be in their class times, right? So, so there are issues for both, and so I guess that might suggest to me that you know we shouldn't. On the one hand, maybe there's there's some basic parameters that are the same, but that we probably shouldn't mandate like things be all exactly, you know, that we shouldn't push too far in the other direction because, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, change in variety helps re renew our attention, helps keep our attention. If every class is doing the exact same thing and looking the exact same way, um, that's probably a sure way to get students less and less interested in the educational experiences they're having. So. You know, I don't have any specific recommendations on that, but I guess that would be my impression is, um, you know, we, we, we probably don't want to err too much on the side of conformity, even though I can I can see the value of having like some basic stuff, like everyone's got to have, you know, their all of us in major course documents online. Like I, I see the value of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but in terms of like how the class is conducted, I guess I wouldn't want to um, see too much conformity that way. Good question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I also uh, I, I like the uh, the blending where we had of um, of uh, you, Jim, with all of your red and Tom with all of his blue. It was, it was pretty nice. <laughs> um, we have uh, uh, a few more questions that are here. I want to make sure that, that we get a chance to raise these. Um, and one of them comes from uh, Alejandra that I mentioned before, um, and uh, she asks about. A really precise question. How do you fold in synchronous opportunities into an already built asynchronous class? Okay, so one of the things, first things I did this, even though I'm not teaching this year, um, I had take I had taught online, um, I had had to shift my class online in the spring. And um, so in order to help me learn better about what students were going to experience, I took an online class this summer. Um, I took Spanish too. Um, so, uh, and it was a it was a uh, online it was a six week intensive online class taught by one of my colleagues. Mm. What he did was, um, you know, he provided most of our content asynchronously, but he had um, discussion sessions in which he was available on Zoom 
for anyone that wanted to practice their oral Spanish. Um, and so those were held two times a week and we would all be able to, and they, the, in this case, they were optional um, because the class had, you know, was designed as a fully online, online class, but he wanted to offer these extra synchronous opportunities. So he just set up two times per week. There were typically, you know, maybe half the class would be in each session uh, and he would just ask us questions and we would respond in Spanish. And so, um, you know, I think that's kind of what, what you want to think about. Like if, you know, students are, like in my case, if I were doing this in the fall, I would probably do something like students are going to read the text. They're going to then respond in a discussion board post. And then we are going to have an additional one hour synchronous discussion per week in which um, I'm going to have read their discussion board posts and, re and, and put questions back to them based on that. Ask them to summarize you know, the, their ideas, other things, and just like the way we would have a traditional discussion in a literature class. So um, I think that's what you want. You want to think about like, what's the active stuff students would be normally doing in class, mm -hmm. uh, like solving problems or, you know, meeting in groups or like having that group discussion um, and, and thinking about how that's this sort of additional layer that's then added on top. That's like the, the structure on top of the foundation, right? Um, that asynchronous foundation. So um, my, like my Spanish course provided a pretty good example for me of what that could look like and how it could be effective. And it was very effective for me. I took advantage of it every week. Well, that sounds great. And you could probably do a better job with Alejandro's name than I can now. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank, thank you for a really, really good question. And uh, um, I love the, pr the, the practicality of that question. And, and Jim, that's a good example of small teaching uh, practice right there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a question from Michael Meeks that, who goes back uh, one step from uh, to Tom's question about innovation and consistency. And he asks, as face-to-face -face students are forced to go online, a template lets students focus on content rather than learn to navigate disparate models where to find X or Y or Z. Yeah, that's a great point. And like th for that reason, like I don't object to things like having a kind of syllabus template or having a kind of, um, you know, where, where everybody can see the same information and like know where to go easily. I think especially in this current situation, that's a pretty good idea. Um, I think what I would, what, where I would want to be able to see the variety is in the, the, the assessments, like what are, you know, we shouldn't all have to be, you know, using the same kinds of assessments in our synchronous sessions. We should be able to, you know, foster discussions or have students doing in there what they want. So I, I agree with you completely, like having, you know, basic requirements for what goes in the LMS so that everyone can have access to it um, and, and know they're gonna be able to access these same documents or, or, or get the information they need or interact with the instructor in certain ways, like having a, you know, a promise about how uh, questions are gonna get answered, how quick they'll be turned around, all that kind of stuff. I think that's fine. Like to me, that doesn't stifle people's pedagogical creativity at all. Mm. And li limitations and, and conditions like that don't have to stifle creativity in the same way that you can be really creative on Twitter in part because you're forced into those 280 characters, right? So like that sometimes can actually force you into more creative thinking. How do I work within this structure um, in a way to kind of, um, you know, accomplish what I want to that can actually create new and innovative thinking. Well, classic, you know, think about the limitations of poetry formats and uh, exactly, exactly. A stanza force. Exactly. Yeah. We have a, a, a question that comes up um, from a slightly different angle. This is the faculty development angle from Kathy Bittman at uh, Hillsborough. Uh, and Kathy asks, what do you say to faculty who feel their particular teaching style would not translate well to an online format? That is a hard question. That's one I probably would have to think about a little bit. Um, I mean, we certainly have had faculty um, on my own campus I know who you know, who are not looking forward to teaching largely um, in these online and hybrid classes. They, they really value the face-to-face -face discussion, which I do too. That's how I've always taught um, with a lot of discussion and engagement. Um, I mean, you know, one thing I guess I would, I would hope that faculty would be open-minded about was that um, you can, you know, let faculty know, look, this is a transitional period, right? Uh, ideally, if, if, if you relish teaching in that face-to-face -face environment and sitting around a table and, and look, you know, talking to each other like that, you're going to be able to get back to that. But this is a time for you to learn some new tools that you might be able to incorporate into that class in the future. Um, this was, ex you know, what, what my experience was. Uh, I had not 
used some of the tools in the LMS that were had long been available to me, mm -hmm. that I tried in the spring semester, and I'm going to use them now. So like my face-to-face -face class is now going to be supplemented by some um, some tech tools that I had never experimented with before. So, you know, hopefully one can appeal to the fact that faculty like to, you know, our learners who are open-minded and want to continue to improve um, in their teaching and that that's the way to look at this experience. It's it's a it's a temporary phase, um, one would hope, at least for, you know, even if, if, even if that temporary means a year or two, um, they'll get back to what they think they're good at and what they know they're good at, but maybe they'll be able to have expanded their repertoire of tools they can use in the classroom. That's a very, very well thoughtful and supportive uh, answer to that great question. Kathy, thank you very much for asking that. I've heard that question uh, all the time. But I've got to ask, Jim, what were those LMS tools that you hadn't used before that you're going to try now? <laughs> I mean, the, the basic one was the discussion board, to be honest with you. Like, I had never used a discussion board before in my own teaching. And and I had always, I'd actually had kind of read really mixed things about discussion boards that sometimes they're used in this very pro forma way. Students are just kind of checking the box. And and, uh, and it was Flower Darby, actually, who convinced me, no, you know, you can use discussion boards well. Um, and there were two things about it that, um, I mean, the, 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 the thing that I liked about it was the thing that lots of people have said. It made sure that everyone's voice got heard, right? So there were, you know, I think when, by the time we switched to remote learning, there were 10 discussion board posts. One, that was how many weeks that were left, or maybe there was eight or something. And I gave, everyone had to only do eight of them. So they didn't have to do it every week. They could choose the ones they were interested in. But the thing that Flower told me to do, which I really, really loved, was... Um, after each week, I would read all the discussion board posts and I picked three to five of them oh. to highlight that I thought were really good. And I made like a five minute video and said, and in which I was kind of, you know, screen sharing the discussion and saying, look, you know, Kathy makes a really excellent point here. Um, this one, this post, you know, is one I really want to um, everyone make sure everyone looks at. And then I kind of just went and did that every week. And I loved it because it was like a way for me to affirm um, the work of students kind of publicly. I tried to make sure that every student got their post affirmed at least once. Um, so I had like a little box checking off of people's names when I mentioned one of their posts um, so that everyone got heard. But I also just found they were really thoughtful. Students who would not normally contribute in class contributed really thoughtful and interesting to the discussion board. So I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna do in the future um, with my, uh, as preparation for discussion rather than having them write at the beginning of class. I'll probably still do some do that occasionally, but I think I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to keep the discussion boards as well. I, I recommend it. It's a it's a powerful, powerful tool. Um, we're almost at the end of our time, however. But we had a question from Joe Moore, so let me see if I can beam him up on stage. And let's see, Joe, do we have you in video? Yeah, it looks like it. Hello. Hey, Hello. Uh, really awesome forum, Brian. First time, first timer here. So Welcome, thanks Jeff. for letting me ask. And James, really uh, insightful stuff. Thanks for sharing. W wanted to ask about group work. Um, I'm I try to incorporate group work into my civil and environmental engineering uh, teaching at Carnegie Mellon, where I'm at. Um, and was curious to hear your thoughts on adapting group work to the online environment. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say about that is. Um, the only kind of comment or insight I would have about is, I mean, I, th I certainly think group work can continue. There are ways, obviously, to do groups and you know breakout sessions and and or to yeah. have you know, their work independently. Um, what what I um, would like to kind of um, another w book that's coming out in the teaching and learning and higher education series that I edit is from um, Biji Sathi and Kelly Hogan about inclusiveness, uh, inclusive teaching, and one of the things that they argue that I've been convinced about is the importance of um, giving students some help in terms of structuring the group. So like letting, you know, finding roles to the group so that, and, and kind of giving them a kind of starting, uh, kind of launching them into the task in ways that uh, will prevent, for example, some students getting silenced, some students not feeling comfortable contributing their ideas to the group. That, 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 and I, this is not something I typically have done um, in the past, but they convinced me that this was something that I needed to start doing. Um, so that you know, there's 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 clearly defined roles. Even if you might not have to assign them, but if you even if you just create the roles, and then the students are um, going to um, segregate themselves into those roles, um, it helps facilitate that process. 
And what I've experienced being in some breakout rooms myself, just like in the past, you know, a few months or whatever, is sometimes it is hard to like kind of get that conversation started and, and like move things along. So putting students into roles and making sure those roles are really clear and then I think can maybe help facilitate that process a little more than like when you're in class and it's like, you know, I, I put students in groups and I get them to work and if a student group's just sitting there, I just walk over to them and say, okay, like, you know, I don't hear you talking here. Why don't you get started, right? Like I can do that much more easily in the classroom than I can um, in this environment. And I think the role assignment can help do that work that I would normally be doing in class. Great. Well, that's Thanks. a great answer. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And uh, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome. Um, Friends, we are uh, right at the end of time. Uh, we have just uh, managed to uh, uh, hit the top of the hour, so I'm afraid that with all all regret, I'm gonna have to let you all go. Um, Jim, thank you so much for being a fantastic, fantastic guest. Uh, I'm thank just you. amazed at, uh, at how much you've, you've communicated and with what uh, calmness and uh, wisdom um, you've, uh, you've managed to uh, uh, share this. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks the, for having me. Oh, our pleasure. The, the quick question is, uh, how can we keep up with you? Um, no one can keep up with your writing speed, but but uh, how about, um, uh, is uh, Twitter the best way to find you? Yes, Lang on course, L-A-N-G on course. Great. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye for that. Um, in the meantime, thank you again. Thank you for coming. All right. Thank you. But friends, don't, don't leave just yet. I just want to quickly uh, walk you through uh, where we are. Uh, we have um, coming up, we have uh, for the next two months, a whole bunch of great topics, including uh, academic women of color, revisiting high flex, work-life balance, how to do webinars well, and more and more. So just if you'd like to learn more about that, just go to tinyurl.com slash form fall 2020. Um, and in the meantime, thank you all so much for coming. Um, please stay in touch with us online and above all, stay safe. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>